The following program, The Russ Belleville Show, is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on The Russ Belleville Show are their own, and The Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. <laughs> From the promise of legalization. Uh, and I think that we need to rethink and decriminalize uh, our, uh, our marijuana To the agony of prohibition. And one major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Rock Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Yeah, I hear you. You had a question for me. Now, here's your host, Radical Russ Belleville. Good day, tokers and tokets, and welcome to the show. It is Tuesday, March 4th, 2014, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. So excited you could be here today. We are just back from uh, Wilsonville, Oregon, the home of Fry's Electronics. Got ourselves some new gear here for the show. Uh, it's not for the studio, though. It's for our remote setup. So when you see us in Atlanta next month, or this month, I should say, see us in Atlanta in a few weeks, or you see us at uh, 420 in Denver, you're going to see our new remote camera uh, kit. If you saw the videos from the uh, from the uh, limousine last night, actually you didn't see them because it was all dark. Well, we've solved that problem. We've got a we got a new camera. It's got some light to it. It's going to be really really handy as we uh, continue our operations here at 420 Radio. All right, we've uh, got plenty to talk about on today's show. Joining us at half past, our guest today is John Walker, the blogger from F uh, Fire Dog Lake's Just Say Now legalization blog. He's got a new book out. It's called After Legalization, and we're going to talk about that today in our Reformers Reader segment. That's at half past, so check that out. Also today we'll have time for a bit of a radical rant. There was uh, there's another bill there in Washington state that looks like it's uh, going to make its way through to try to devastate medical marijuana there. I'm going to give you my opinion on the state of medical marijuana in Washington and what we ought to do about it. Also on today's show, it's Daily Toker Tunes time, so it's Electric Tuesday. Electric Bob will be calling up. We'll have a great electronic track from him later on today, 20 after the hour. But first we'll start things off with our 420 Radio News, where we've got all sorts of laws getting passed uh, all across the country, including decrim in Washington, D.C., decrim in New Hampshire, a look at medical marijuana passing in Georgia, believe it or not, uh, some polls out of Iowa and North Carolina, and the uh, UN's drug watchdog is pretty upset about legalization in Washington and Colorado. Then stay tuned for hour two, because in Toker Talk Radio, I've got that video for you from the uh, Minnesota History Museum, the exhibit American Spirits. The Rise and Fall of Prohibition. We'll show that to you in two parts as we get into Hour 2, Toker Talk Radio. Thanks for supporting us here at 420radio.org. You can do so by becoming a VIP member at 420radio.org for as little as $4.20 a month. You'll get access to our Toker Talk Radio archives, our daily Toker Tune archives, and at higher levels, discounts on the items in our 420 Radio shop. The news is next. We'll be right back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors. Support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the Russ Belleville Show. You're tuned into the Russ Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. The Law Offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. 
There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the best way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all of my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at omarfigueroa.com. 420 Radio, fighting prohibition since 2012. Cannabis Outreach Collective is an alternative health and wellness option located in Gladstone, Oregon that serves patients in the Portland area and beyond. We are a full-service alternative health and wellness collective accommodating patients with natural, organic, holistic, and homeopathic remedies, nutritional guidance, advice, education, and medical cannabis fully in accordance with Oregon OMMP law. You can find out more about Cannabis Outreach Collective on Facebook at COC503 or by emailing Cannabis Outreach Collective 503 at gmail.com or by telephone at 503 853 1319. Check out our menu on Weed Maps and visit Cannabis Outreach Collective today. This is your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, March 4th, 2014, brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. I'm Russ Belville. The Washington, D.C. City Council has voted to decriminalize personal marijuana possession. Current laws in the district treat possession of an ounce of marijuana as a misdemeanor and six months in jail or a $1,000 fine. After a nearly unanimous vote, the council agreed to make marijuana possession a civil fine of merely $25. The vote also reduces the penalty for public pot smoking from the same six-month or $1,000 misdemeanor to 60 days or a $500 fine. Experts conclude the passage of the bill will eliminate the probable cause police officers have to arrest someone for the sight or smell of marijuana itself, but officers would still be able to make arrests if they smell or see marijuana smoke. Said council member Tommy Wells, who is running for mayor, quote, I am not an advocate for the use of marijuana in public or private, but an end to the criminalization and disenfranchisement of majoritively African-American D.C. residents, end quote. Statistics show that 90% of marijuana arrests for possession in the District of Columbia are African-Americans. The New Hampshire House Committee on Criminal Justice and Public Safety advanced a decriminalization bill today. New Hampshire is the only state in New England that treats personal possession as a crime. Any amount of marijuana is a misdemeanor that earns up to a year in prison and a $2,000 fine. House Bill 1625, which is expected to pass when the House votes on it next month, reduces possession of an ounce to a civil fine of $100 and reduces cultivation of six plants down from a felony to a Class A misdemeanor. According to polling in January by public policy polling, 62% of New Hampshire voters approve of such decriminalization. Said Matt Simon, who heads New Hampshire's operations for the Marijuana Policy Project, quote, Nobody should be saddled with a criminal record simply for possessing a substance that is objectively less harmful than alcohol. This should be the year New Hampshire brings its penalties into line with the neighboring states. End quote. The Georgia House has passed a bill legalizing only high CBD, low THC medical marijuana. On a 171 to 4 vote, the House approved the bill that reactivates a 1980 medical marijuana law for sufferers of cancer and glaucoma and adds certain seizure disorders. Patients would only be able to access liquid forms of high CBD oil from just five research hospitals in the state. Representative Sharon Cooper, chairwoman of the Health and Human Services Committee, warned that the research hospitals may balk at the program for fear of losing federal funding or even being federally prosecuted. 
but she supported the bill. Representative Alan Peake, the bill's sponsor, emphasized how tightly controlled the program would be, saying, quote, It's not a slippery slope toward legalization of cannabis for recreational use. I stand firmly against that direction and will fight it with all my energy, end quote. A new poll in Iowa shows residents strongly in support of medical marijuana, but strongly opposed to legalization. The Iowa poll shows that 59% of voters support allowing the medical use of cannabis. However, 69% of Iowans oppose recreational legalization. Both results are similar to poll numbers from last year, despite the rollout of marijuana legalization in Washington and Colorado. In 2010, medical marijuana polled at 64%, but was worded to include a doctor's approval, while the latest polls just asked about legalizing medical use of marijuana without mentioning any doctor. Meanwhile, in North Carolina, a new poll shows 51% opposition to marijuana legalization, with women's support lagging 14 points behind men's, and only political independents and people under age 40 supporting legalization. Polling last year showed 76% support for medical marijuana in the Tar Heel State. On Tuesday, the International Narcotics Control Board, a watchdog agency of the United Nations, said it, quote, deeply regrets, end quote, marijuana legalization in Washington and Colorado. The INCB says legalization violates international drug control treaties and makes it more difficult to conduct worldwide anti-drug efforts. Last week, General John F. Kelly from the U.S. Southern Command testified to Congress that Latin American countries are more reluctant to engage U.S.-led anti-drug efforts in the hemisphere. Quote, Most of the countries I deal with were in utter disbelief that we would legalize marijuana, he explained. They're very polite to me, but every now and again when they're not so polite, the term hypocrite gets into the discussion. They're starting to chatter a lot about, well, why don't we just step back and let it flow? End quote. This has been your 420 Radio News for Tuesday, March 4th, 2014. I'm Russ Belville. Transcripts of 420 Radio News are available at ncc420.com. Visit now and download today. You're listening to the Russ Belville Show on 420radio.org. We'll be right back. Starting up a medical cannabis business, you don't just want any attorney. You want a fired up lawyer who understands the needs of cannabis consumers. The law office of Lauren Vasquez is your fired up lawyer for the cannabis industry. Lauren Vasquez knows the details of California marijuana law from both a personal and professional angle. Lauren Vasquez rose from the ranks of college normal activists to become one of the Bay Area's best marijuana lawyers. Visit her website, firedupmoyer.com, or call 1 855 MMJ Laws for more information. That's 855 665 5297 for Lauren Vasquez, your fired up lawyer, or email firedupmoyer at gmail.com. The number again is 855 MMJ Laws, 855 665 5297 for your fired up lawyer, Lauren Vasquez. Lauren Vasquez is an activist attorney you can trust. Call today. Let him bring in the beat. Adam Hand of Handmade Apparel produces quality custom designs for t-shirts, hats, and other apparel. Handmade Apparel is the official design shop for 420 Radio, The Russ Belvel Show, Ganja John, and Cascadia Concentrates, among many clients who rely on Adam Hand for everything from short-run custom projects to full-run clothing lines. Adam's meticulous designs are individually crafted and screened in vibrant high-definition color. Visit handmadeapparel.biz to browse the selection of handmade gear or to get a personal quote for your own designs. Handmade Apparel, a proud supporter of 420radio.org. That's right. Groovin'. 
keeping it mellow here at the Funky Roller Ring. So join me, Big Daddy, every Thursday night. Mm. The doors open at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific, baby. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Groove on. Welcome back, everyone. Time for us to go behind the headlines. And today we're taking a look at cannabis and just how it's beginning to take off now that uh, Colorado has legalized sales and Washington is about to follow right behind. And uh, this came to me uh, via one of my uh, social networks, but it was noticed that the first marijuana commercial to ever debut on a major network uh, has been shown. Apparently it's on uh, Comedy Central and E and a few other of the uh, major cable, you know, uh, basic cable networks. And it's showing, I, f- I forget exactly the uh, the cable market. It's not all across the country, but uh, in cer- certain select cable markets. Uh, let me give you a look at it. It's from the folks out at Marijuana Doctors. And you can get an idea what this uh, first marijuana ad ever get uh, kind of looks like. Yo, you want sushi? I got sushi. I got the best sushi. This area is dry, man. You know that. I know that. Ain't nobody selling but me. I got tuna. I got salmon. I got sweet shrimp. I got the finest sashimi this area has seen in years. You need me and I need you. Let's make this work. You buy some sashimi, I'll throw in some rice paper, man. Totally free. Gratis. I got everything. Even California rolls, baby. You wouldn't buy your sushi from this guy. So why would you buy your marijuana from him? MarijuanaDoctors.com is the only service that connects patients with real doctors for medical marijuana recommendations. Simple, confidential, safe. Visit MarijuanaDoctors.com or call 1-866-996-9333. That's MarijuanaDoctors.com, 1-866-996-9333. Book your appointment today. All right, so the folks out at MarijuanaDoctors.com getting their ad in. And according to the uh, report here on High Times, uh, Jason Drazen, who's the founder of the Medical Cannabis Network, said the commercial is slated to appear exclusively in New Jersey, appearing on popular stations like A&E, MTV2, History Channel, Comedy Central, ESPN, and Fox News. But if you're looking for it, don't look for it in prime time because it's primarily going to be in the early morning hours before 5 a.m. So it's going to be that uh, late night, uh, if you will, which I don't know, it kind of kind of fits our community pretty well, I would say, as far as uh, the people that you're looking for. Uh, there's also a great uh, article out in High Times about the marijuana uh, business, cannabis business. Marijuana is the next best investment Uh, is the best investment for the next 10 years article with a uh, Todd Harrison, who's the CEO of Minian, Minianville, uh, a financial media and publishing company. And uh, looking at different stocks here, uh, the marijuana index of stocks has gone 120, gone up 125% in February. According to market watch, the total index valuation soared beyond $6 billion, partly due to Canavest achieving unprecedented valuations and following several listing additions to the index. But you got to be careful because on the other side of this, you've got pink sheet stocks. you got these penny stocks that can oftentimes just be a whole lot of hype, a whole lot of pump and dump, uh, just trying to uh, ride the wave of popularity of marijuana and then leave you holding the bag when these uh, when these companies uh, go bust. Think uh, Wolf of Wall Street or think Boiler Room, some of these uh, different movies that have kind of shown that. So I would encourage people, of course, get involved in investing in cannabis business, but make sure that you're getting some reliable sources for your information. There's a few different uh, investment groups that have uh, popped up. High Times has a uh, capital group that they've put together. ArcView, Privateer Holdings, there's a few of them out there. Do your due diligence, do your research, but certainly find a way to get involved into the next best investment for the next decade. It's said that the marijuana market is going to be growing faster than any market in the United States or worldwide. It's going to outpace the smartphone market. That's pretty amazing. And the numbers we've seen coming out of uh, Colorado already promising anywhere from 600 million to a billion dollars worth of marijuana revenue happening each year in that state. And then the tax revenue coming from that, uh, people are very happy about this in Colorado. 
Colorado. We'll be bringing you all of these uh, business seminars that keep happening. There's one happening at the end of this month uh, in Eugene, Oregon that we will be at, and we will bring you more interviews as time goes on with these leaders in business and investment for your can of business. But right now, it's 20 after the hour, and that means it's time for us to take our mandated union break. I love our union. Don't you love our union? (laughs) Gotta love our union. Stick around, folks. We'll be right back with some Daily Toker tunes. Oh, have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. Have you ever met that funny reefer man? A reefer man. If he said he swam to China, he would send you South Carolina. Then you know you're talking to that reefer man. I'm a reefer smoking man. Woodpipe Smoke Shop and Speakeasy is your source for cannabis community gear in southern Wisconsin. Owners Brian and Tammy Wood are located in Kendall, just outside of Madison, and they've got everything for the smoking enthusiast, including a full assortment of pipes, water pipes, hookahs, bubblers, one-hitters, and so much more. They're open noon to 8 p.m. Monday through Saturday and can help you with your detoxification therapies as well. Call 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com for more information. That's 608-466-7473 or email woodpipes at yahoo.com. And as always, Go Pack Go! Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. Darling, your mercy. I'm a doctor. I'm a lawyer. I'm a journalist. I'm a student. I'm a teacher. I'm a representative. I have cancer. The outdated laws of prohibition are more dangerous than the plant itself. I lost my scholarship. I was fired. 20 million arrests since 1965. This is getting ridiculous. Our prisons are overcrowded with nonviolent offenders. We have the opportunity to change. This is costing our country billions of dollars. Making my family and I fight in a courtroom is difficult enough when I'm already fighting through chemotherapy. There's no reason to be scared by tradition anymore. We can stop this. We can stop this. We are the American people. We can stop this. And you have our support. We are old. Young. Straight. Gay. We're every race and nationality. And we're not going to give up. You can tax it. You can regulate it. Apply age restrictions. You can create millions of new jobs. We can save our economy. President Obama. It's time for legalization. Legalization. Yes. We can. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together. So let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes. The best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Electric Tuesday, featuring the latest in electronic dance music and other cutting edge genres. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily toker tune. All right, welcome back, everybody. It's 24 after the hour, and time for us to go to our phone lines where we've got Electric Bob waiting in the wings. How you doing, Bob? I'm doing great. How you doing, Russ? Oh, good to hear from you, man. How's things in Arizona? Uh, things are beautiful right now. It's about 76 outside. I got my window open with my fan blowing in. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, how's, uh, or, how's Portland? Oh, so it's doing really good here, man. We're really, uh, the weather's about where it should be. You know, it's uh, kind of kind of rainy, kind of wet, but a lot better than it was in uh, Minnesota. Let me tell you that for sure. 
Oh, I bet. I seen I seen the video of you getting picked up by the magic uh, the magic butter bus. It looked like fun. Yeah, we had a, we had a great time doing that. Big thanks to our friends out there at Magical Butter for uh, you know giving us that that fun little tour, taking around. We're going to be building a really good alliance with those guys. So uh, we're looking at having uh, you know sponsorship and support and uh, all sorts of stuff that we can't talk about yet, but uh, we will definitely talk about it soon. <laughs> Hey, uh, all right, let's get to our Electric Tuesday here because I'm looking up in the posts here and it looks as though you got a group called Kids in Tracksuits. Do I have the right song? Yes, it's the right song. This is, uh, actually, I played this, I played something by them a a while back that you liked and I figured I'd put something else on that you liked. This is a campfire song. This is off of, um... This is off of just a random uh, mix that was a compilation that had like four other unreleased songs on it that I found, and I, it's a good song. I really dig it. All right. Well, uh, let's. Anything we need to know about the artists, uh, where they're from, or anything like that? Um, it's uh, it's two DJs. They're broken up now. They've been broken up since I think '06 or '07. It's uh, one DJ is lone, and he's still doing stuff. He's still putting out stuff. The other guy that was with him i don't know he just like dropped off the map (laughs) all right well that's good enough let's get to it this is kids in tracksuits with campfire song thanks bob we'll talk to you next week mood music for listening and relaxation gives you two things that are really essential to every comfortable home on the one hand you have music that you can enjoy at any time and on the other you have the right music for special times When you have friends in for supper, when you throw a party, or when you just want to sit and see pictures in the fire.
very soothing. Support the Russ Belleville Show. Text the word Russ to 420-420 and connect with the National Cannabis Coalition. You can also send 10 bucks to the Russ Belleville Show right from your smartphone. That's Russ to 420-420. You're listening to Radical Russ on the Russ Belleville Show. New Approach Oregon is a coalition of Oregon citizens who believe that treating marijuana use as a crime has failed costing taxpayers millions in law enforcement resources. We believe it's time for a new approach on marijuana and that Oregonians deserve a chance to decide in the 2014 general election. Our approach will regulate, tax, and legalize marijuana for adults in Oregon. By implementing a strict system to regulate, tax, and legalize marijuana, we can move Oregon forward and create new revenue for critical services. Under our approach for 2014, 40% of funds would support K-12 education, 20% would support mental health and treatment services, and 15% would be dedicated to law enforcement. Public opinion, coupled with victories in Washington and Colorado, confirms marijuana legalization is inevitable. Visit our website at newapproachoregon.com or our page on Facebook at New Approach Oregon. Thank you. The best weapon you can have in the Prohibition War is your mind. Fill your head with the knowledge you need by checking out this latest entry in the Russ Belleville Show's Reformers Reader. All right, welcome back, everybody. It is 33 after the hour, and in our Reformers Reader segment today, we are joined by John Walker from Just Say Now. How you doing, John? Hey, thanks for having me on. Oh, so glad to have you here, and uh, we are looking at this book. It's after legalization, understanding the future of marijuana policy, and uh, good to see that we've got uh, books now that we can talk about what we're going to do next. Uh, what is the uh, primary thesis of your book, John? Well, I basically look at the sort of current trajectories, both in marijuana legalization and sort of the history of the sort of post-prohibition era for alcohol to try to create a realistic picture of where the legalization, you know, where the legalization of marijuana is heading. Um, I want to get people thinking about it because there's a really serious status quo bias in politics. Mm -hmm. And my favorite example is the Electoral College. <laughs> you know, it's a really stupid idea, but we still have it 200 years later because a stupid idea was put in place and it's really tough to change. Okay, so moving forward after legalization, you know, making the comparisons to what the 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 uh, political status looked like after uh, the end of alcohol prohibition, uh, what sort of uh, similarities do you point out and do you find a lot of differences between the two? I know there's a lot of really impressive similarities. Um, you know, when prohibition first ended, a bunch of states were voting to stop enforcing prohibition. Some of the first states to do that were Colorado and Washington. <laughs> I put it on the ballot. Um, you know, the argument about taxes was a big part of the anti-alcohol prohibition thing. You know, there's people who held like, uh, you know, beer for taxes rallies, um, you know, because of the fear the Depression, they're losing revenue. Um, and a lot of the issues just sort of come up again. Like, the local option issue is really important. Um, you know, that's giving individual towns the ability to sort of opt out of marijuana. I just saw, and I believe it's Garden City, is a tiny little town in the middle of a what's now a dry weed county in uh, Colorado that decided to allow marijuana sales. And that's how the town was formed originally to get around the local dry laws then to sell alcohol. Yeah, they've uh, Garden City has gotten quite of a quite a windfall. And again, this uh, goes back to uh, prohibition history. They were one of the uh, wet towns after uh, alcohol prohibition. So it seems like that's kind of their niche, huh? Yeah, you know, it's it's exact. You know, history completely repeating itself. You know, whatever about seventy years later. 
Yeah, you, you made a mention of price and taxes. In fact, that's a couple of chapters in your book here. Uh, what do you expect to see? I mean, a lot of people when legalization first took, you know, took hold uh, in January in Colorado, at least at the retail level, uh, there were a lot of people throughout the social networks that were, you know, screaming bloody murder about the high taxes and the high prices of legalized weeds saying, you know, they're just going to stick with the black market. How do you see that shaking out? Well, you know, you know, obviously there's going to be a transition period. And obviously prices were high because, you know, not only you had a very limited number of stores that were actually opened when marijuana first went on sale, you had a huge amount of interest both in the state and just internationally, people just coming to show up to say they bought weed, you know, in the first week or whatever. So that really helped drive up prices. But I think long term, we're going to see prices start heading down, um, even with the taxes, because... You know, the black market is just such an expensive way to do business compared to a, you know, legal, normal market. Um, but we will see very high taxes. You know, if we look at cigarettes, more Americans smoke cigarettes than smoke marijuana. Um, and that has been just like a go-to revenue source just around the country in the, cross, in the, the federal government. We're speaking with John Walker, who's the author of this new book, After Legalization, Understanding the Future of Marijuana Policy. You can also follow his writing on Just Say Now, the uh, blog that's part of Fire. Are you still part of Fire Dog Lake or did it spin off independently or how does that work? Uh, no, no, we're still part of Fire Dog Lake. Okay, okay, great. Uh, and uh, as we're looking at after legalization and, and specifically, you know, to stick on the uh, tax uh, for just a second, uh, I was reading something from Mark Kleiman, who had uh, advised Washington State on their tax scheme. And he had said that the way to go about doing this as far as taxes go wouldn't be taxing the price of marijuana, as in like a percentage, but instead taxing by weight or potency. Do you deal or delve into any of that? And how do you think those things will eventually wind up? Yeah, I found, I found his piece very interesting because, you know, a lot of what he wants is sort of what I predict will happen because, you know, he and a lot of people like him who don't like marijuana legalization but are at least talking about the post-legalization period are really pushing for these things. So, I, you know, but that seems like a very natural way to go. You know, when we look at alcohol taxes um, or cigarette taxes, we don't tax based on price for those. We tax based on quantity. So the excise tax on cigarettes is, you know, relative to the pack of cigarettes. It doesn't matter if it's like a low-end brand or high-end brand. Right. And when it comes to alcohol, um, you know, or like hard alcohol, the amount of hard alcohol excise tax is based on how much hard alcohol or the percentage of alcohol in it. Um, and, you know, that just sort of seems like that will be the natural route um, that will be heading to marijuana legalization. That hasn't started yet, but I think that's probably going to be coming in the future. You know, you uh, mentioned uh, the institutional uh, uh, momentum or the institutional lack thereof once something becomes legal and it becomes hard to change. The status quo kind of has its own inertia. Uh, with that in mind and looking at the legalization that's taken place in Colorado and especially in Washington now where there's you know no home grow and it looks like you know very, very high taxation, how do you forecast that, say, legalization in Oregon or other nearby states may affect uh, those laws or are we going to be stuck with them in Washington and Colorado the way they are for a while? Well, yeah, you could easily be stuck with at least certain aspects of the law for a long time. Um, you know, most people don't know that brewing beer at home uh, was illegal into the 70s on a federal level. Um, and it's only become legal in a few states in like the past year or two. Like I think the last few states to allow home brewing were Mississippi and Alabama last year. Hmm. Um, so, you know, you had a really long lag time between when alcohol was actually legal, you know, beer was actually legal to buy, but it was legal, but it was still illegal to produce at home. Hmm. Um, because, you know, it's, it's not like a top priority issue. I, I'm a home brewer. But, you know, we make up maybe less than 1% of the, you know, beer-drinking public. Um, and it's, you know, it's tough to get together and really push for these changes when you're talking about sort of a smaller point like that. So it's really important to get it right the first go-around, because going back and changing it, that, that, that's a lot more work. Mm, okay. Uh, looking at, uh, you have some other chapters in here that uh, bring up some questions to me. One of them would be the impact on public health. And one of the uh, dire predictions of the people who don't like legalization is the fact that making it legal and more accessible and, and somewhat uh, even promoted uh, may lead to greater use in America and particularly among teens, among young people. Uh, what are your predictions for after legalization with respect to public health? Yeah, you know, I, 
people always talk about how, you know, the big sort of buzzword, especially when it's the prohibitionists, you know, we got to protect the kids. Prohibition's been such an absolute failure at keeping marijuana away from teenagers. Um, there was some pollings and surveys showing that, um, I think it was like from like 2005 to 2010 or whatever, more teens said marijuana was easier to get than cigarettes. Mm-hmm. You know, if you, I think, you know, most surveys I've seen, it's something like 80% of teenagers say it'd be incredibly easy for them to get marijuana currently, you know, with prohibition in place. So prohibition has been an absolute failure in that regard. You know, teens are very good at getting stuff that they want, but if anything, legalization will make it slightly more difficult. You know, a drug dealer does not card. Um, and all these shops, especially the way they're being regulated, you know, with cameras um, and, you know, the loss of licenses and everything, they're definitely going to have a huge incentive not to sell to underage people, which is what you don't have in the black market. Sure thing. How about adult use? Do you see uh, a mass increase coming in adult use of marijuana? Yeah, I, like, that's another thing. People always sort of talk about this. It just doesn't really seem to make sense to me. Um, most people don't not smoke marijuana for legal reasons. When you ask people why they make most decisions in life, it's a, it's a very personal matter. Uh, and if we look at, you know, across multiple countries, um, the severity or lack of severity of marijuana loss has very little indication on how often it's used. Um, so, you know, they've done studies in Europe where, you know, making the, you know, basically decriminalizing it or upping the penalties, it's almost no change in the number of people using it. You know, we looked over at the Netherlands where it's been quasi-legal or basically legal for decades now. They use, they have less people smoking marijuana than the United States does. Um, so I just don't think it will be that big of a factor. The one thing I do think we will see change is we've got sort of this really old generation. Um, they grew up with no exposure to marijuana when they were younger. Um, you know, they still very much oppose it. Once they get replaced, we'll probably see some modest uptick. But that was going to happen anyway as part of sort of the cultural change. Mm. But I don't think, you know, we're not a bunch of animals running around just waiting to do something until the law holds us back. You know, that's just not how society is. John Walker is the author of After Legalization, Understanding the Future of Marijuana Policy. And one of the chapters in your book is of of great importance here in the Pacific Northwest. What becomes of medical marijuana after legalization? Yeah, you know, this I thought was like a very fascinating aspect of it. And I think it's going to be, you know, a real sort of big fight, at least in certain states. You know, there's a bunch of states which don't have any real medical program right now, so it won't be such a big deal there. Um, you know, we're already seeing right now in Washington, they're trying to bring the le- the medical system in line with the recreational system. Um, and I think what we will see once marijuana becomes more accepted and once the federal government sort of begins to end its absurd, you know, opposition to any marijuana research, any, you know, marijuana-based medication, they will see the sort of the emergence of a uh, sort of FDA-approved medical marijuana um, and that probably won't come in the form of, you know, actual marijuana butts. That will be usually sprays or extracts or specific compounds that are being isolated. And that is really how I see things taking. And then we'll be sort of in this weird place with a sort of legal remnant um, that used to exist. And I suspect that's going to start to be phased out pretty steadily. Hmm. All right. It's after legalization, understanding the future of marijuana policy. John Walker from the Just Say Now blog at Fire Dog Lake is the author. You got some great, uh, uh, great uh, endorsements here on the back from uh, Glenn Greenwald and Ryan Grimm, two of my favorite writers. So uh, good, <laughs> good job getting those. Tell folks how they can get a copy of this book if they want to. There, John. Oh uh, yeah, you know you can uh, find it just on Amazon or any sort of where else you buy books online. Um, you know, just look for after legalization. We'll come right up. All right. Will we see you in Denver for 420? Um, I have not planned to get out there yet. I might try to, though. Um, still got to work on my schedule. All right. Well, if you make it there, stop by the 420 radio booth, and uh, we'll be glad to talk more about your book. Hope you have some great sales, and uh, thanks for putting this together. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. All right. John Walker from uh, Just Say Now. The book is After Legalization, Understanding the Future of Marijuana Policy. And uh, thanks again for joining us. All right. When we come back, we'll have time for a radical rant. Speaking of what happens to medical marijuana after legalization, we're going to take a look at the state of Washington. 
Oh boy. Stick around. The voice of the Marijuana Nation. Georgia. Hi, this is Willie Nelson, and I need your help. Alcohol prohibition didn't work in the 20s, and marijuana prohibition isn't working today. It's time we stop arresting law-abiding citizens because they prefer marijuana over alcohol. Nearly 2,000 Americans are arrested every day on marijuana charges. We're unfairly destroying the lives and careers of hundreds of thousands of people each year simply because they smoke marijuana. These are not criminals, they're average citizens like you, good neighbors who work hard, raise families, pay taxes, and contribute to their communities. We need your help to end marijuana prohibition once and for all. It's the fair thing to do. For more information, contact Normal, the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. Call toll-free 888-67-NORML or visit their website at norml.org. 420 Radio, your ticket to the Boston Freedom Rally. Hey, Lindsay. I wish you didn't smoke weed. You're not the same when you smoke, and I miss my friend. I'll be outside. And now, a message from former President George W. Bush to remind the American people of our responsibility in our nation's war on certain American citizens who are not pharmaceutical, non alcoholic, tobacco free drugs. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. That's right, America, use less drugs. Put down the Prozac, the Biox, and the Levitra and turn to the herb. Use less drugs. Our national policy is no longer just say no, it's now just slow down. You get me too high I overanalyze If you've ever been too high Then you can sympathize You get me too, too high And I start to fly If I said some silly thing then that's You want answers? I'm as mad as hell And I'm not gonna take this anymore You want answers? You have offended my family I think I'm entitled. You want answers. I want the truth. And you have offended a Shaolin temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! Radical Grant. All right, folks. Time to get into it. Uh, today, I you was know, really behind because I had to go down to... Uh, uh, Wilsonville today, so I don't have all my Chiron set up like I normally would, so I apologize for that for those of you watching on the replay or the uh, the live feed right now. But uh, I got to talk about this because I, I saw this post up on the Weed blog from Anthony Martinelli out at Sensible Washington. And it's about the House Bill 2149 up there in Washington, which is the bill to gut Washington State's medical cannabis law. Uh, and it didn't get a public hearing in the Senate Ways and Means Committee. That means it won't be advancing. So that's good news for the folks that want to keep the status quo of Washington State medical marijuana. But, he says, according to the staff of the committee, the proposal will be implemented into an upcoming budget bill, which will be voted on in the coming days. This is really bad news. Because this is a kind of a situation where uh, the thing is kind of contentious and unpopular, so we're not going to put it forward on its own where everybody's going to get mad about it and be a big stink about it. Let's put it into a budget bill because everybody wants to pass a budget. Everybody wants to get the money flowing, and then it's a little harder to oppose these little extra things tacked into it, like destroying the medical marijuana program. So that's a little sneaky uh, legislative trick there, but... I'm going to talk about how the legislators are tearing this thing apart because 
obviously they've got some ill intent in, in here, or maybe not ill intent, but the intent, like John Walker said, to bring medical in line with recreational. This leads the people who are medical supporters in Washington state to scream bloody murder. And I, I, I can see why I understand why, but there's a certain amount of this that they've got to take the responsibility for. There's a certain amount of this that is the blame of the activist community supporting medical marijuana in Washington for not getting it to a regulated state so that there wouldn't be such a huge disparity between medical and recreational. In Anthony Martinelli's uh, post, he points out that we've got to uh, urge lawmakers to oppose these regressive changes. Oppose these regressive changes. What terrible, awful thing is being proposed here that is so regressive that it must be opposed. A mandatory patient registry. A patient registry. That's what we got to get all upset about is a patient registry. You know, like 18 other medical marijuana states have. The only state that does not have some form of statewide patient registry is California. See, this is where I've got the problem somewhat. And, and I've got this issue with the activists in Washington state because... They make a mountain out of every molehill that every single possible compromise or change is to be 100% absolutely universally opposed instead of recognizing some of the political uh, realities and making intelligent compromises in order to protect the most of it, right? It's, you know, half a loaf's better than none. Don't let the uh, perfect be the enemy of the good. An example I can give you from Oregon. In Oregon, we had this situation where you could have three ounces of, of marijuana and you could grow like three mature and four immature plants. We wanted to increase that limit. We wanted to make sure patients could get more medicine, grow more and, and possess more. And in getting that, we negotiated away the right to an affirmative defense for someone who is over those limits. We figured that, look, most medical marijuana patients are going to do fine with an ounce or two or three or hell even six or eight right most of them are going to be fine but for those who really need who really really need that extra amount we'll get it to 24 ounces and then we'll get rid of the affirmative defense that people were using in the old days back when they could only have three ounces to be able to get away with more we made it we made a compromise thinking that 24 ounces ought to to work for almost everybody but we'll trade away that affirmative defense. It was an intelligent negotiation. And there were some hardcore 100% never back down people back then in 2005 who opposed that as well. Don't hear so much for the, of their opposition these days. So when I hear these medical marijuana activists in Washington state screaming about a patient registry as if it were the second coming of Hitler or something, it shows me and I'm pretty sure it's got to show the legislators and the people of Washington state that hey, those folks aren't interested in any sort of reasonable negotiations. I mean, a patient registry has been compared by some of the people in the Washington State medical marijuana community to a sex offender registry. I don't know if they realize they're insulting the people in the other 18 states who go and get their medical marijuana cards by comparing them to sex offenders. But see, I think there's a critical difference in the two lists that we're talking about. There's one government list that provides a way for people to know where the convicted sex offenders are. And the other one is the one that keeps you from getting arrested. See, patients in Washington state don't even have protection from arrest. The only medical marijuana state where they don't have protection from arrest because they don't have a registry system. Another thing I, we're told to oppose here, uh, the shutting down of all collective gardens. Now, this the collective garden thing was a compromise that happened when in 2011 they tried to pass some regulations for Washington State's medical marijuana that was, you know, Wild West out of control. They had all these dispensaries that had popped up that were using a wink, wink, nudge, nudge definition of a caregiver. Basically, Washington State law said you can be a caregiver for a patient, one patient at a time. You can only be a, a caregiver for one patient at one time. So they set up a storefront. The guy at the counter pretends he's a caregiver and the line of people out the door are stepping up to be a care to be given care to one patient at a time. So technically I'm a caregiver. He's a patient. 
And then he walks away two minutes later and the next person comes up. Now that's my patient. And everybody knew that was not the intent of the law. That was not what they were trying to legalize. But boy, the medical people in Washington were more than willing to jump through that wide open loophole and hold it open as wide as they could for everybody else to jump through. And finally, in 2011, when they tried to come up with some regulations to close down that loophole, Governor Gregoire was a chicken and vetoed him because of some threats from the uh, from the U.S. attorneys. But they came up with a compromise. OK, it is unreasonable to think that every patient should grow their own medicine. So as a compromise, we'll come up with these collective gardens where 10 patients can collectively cultivate up to 45 plants. But once again, the Washington people said, oh, so now my storefront is a collective garden. And as long as I've only got nine patients listed in my collective at one time, then we're just a collective and we can keep operating like we always were and not pay taxes and not have any regulations. So... The and I'm, I shouldn't paint all activists with this brush. I'm sure there's plenty in Washington State who fought for you know reasonable regulations, but there's more than enough of them who get more than enough ink and airtime, who fight to have every loophole, to have every extension granted to them, to get away with every wink and nudge they can, and then want to scream bloody murder when we set up a regulated recreational system. And you can't have a completely unregulated Wild West world going alongside of that. And in Oregon, meanwhile, we fought to make our world more regulated and worked with legislators. Rather than just allow wink, wink, nudge, nudge dispensaries to start proliferating, on 2004, we put together a citizen's initiative to regulate them and tax them. In 2010, we put together an initiative to regulate and tax them. Now, they both lost. And dispensaries popped up anyway. And they use some wink, wink, nudge, nudge with caregiver and reimbursement. But the good faith effort we put forth to use our time and capital and resources to put initiatives on the ballot to try to regulate this stuff showed our legislators and showed the public that our activists are interested in having regulations, are interested in making sure that there's a certain amount of tax revenue that's raised from this that helps the rest of the people out. We were happy with a registry system. We're fine with the registry. Not always fine with the way it's used. There have been, there's situations where there's subpoenas or cops that might be poking around when they shouldn't. But by and large, it's been for the past, oh, what is it, 13, 14 years now, it's been pretty successful. People are pretty happy with having a card that pre prevents them from getting arrested. It just, to me, it says something that you have... Colorado that worked to set up a very strictly regulated medical system and, and in some respects too strict, but set up a strictly regulated system. And when it rolls out recreational, it's wonderful. Nobody's complaining. The medical people are happy. The recreational people are happy. The state is happy. The tax collectors are happy. The public is happy. Interesting that we have well-regulated there and medical and recreational get along, but in Washington state, where it was let to run wild west, bringing in recreational is causing problems. And interesting that Oregon, that's fairly well regulated, is also rolling out legalization plans that are pretty friendly. Hey, that's all the time we got today. Uh, for Brian the Red, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for Hour 2. We're going to Minnesota and the Prohibition Museum. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you giant, you own it, you smoke it. You take a scene, you manage, you grow it, you giant, you own it, you smoke it.